Hello and welcome to CrowdCon 2020, the virtual edition. I just want to briefly apologize in advance. The video I planned on releasing corrupted, which led to this resulting mess. I do plan on uploading a more put together video on YouTube in the future, hopefully without the corrupted files. So today I'll be addressing of how you can introduce plants successfully within the hermit crab enclosure, giving general tips and advice that I've learned throughout my time of keeping live plants within the setup. I do plan on touching on topics including how to introduce plants, types of plants you can introduce, as well as general plant care within the crab attack. Okay, I gotta address the large elephant in the room. Who am I? For those that may not know, I'm Jade Silva and have been a crab enthusiast since the early 2012. If you haven't guessed already, I'm an Aussie and my primary interest lies in aquariums and the subset of aquariums, indoor gardening, houseplants and crabbing. This may be the result of my studies at university, currently undertaking a double bachelor's science in biological sciences. Primarily, I spend most of my time on Hermit Crab Association as part of the moderating team on both Facebook and the main forum. As you can see, I'm a member of various Hermit Crab related groups. Probably not something to brag about. In the process, it allowed me the opportunity to learn about different styles and methods regarding crab care. It also allowed me the opportunity in understanding numerous ways to keep crabs successfully, allowing myself to explore differences in opinion, thoughts, and recommendations. Before we proceed, I like to look at the positives and negatives to determine if plants are right for myself or you. It is important to look at the negatives as well as the positives, so that way you can give yourself an informed decision. In my opinion, yes, plants are worth it, but I might be a bit biased. Let's start with the positives. What I find to be the most important is that it offers numerous hiding and climbing places. Not only that, but it's visually for us as well as the crabs. Plants also remove toxic compounds through nutrient export. Toxic compounds naturally will build up within the enclosure as it's a sealed ecosystem. The plants also help remove excess water and then release it as water vapor through respiration or photosynthesis. I'll say this outright, crabs will destroy plants. The plants can be expensive and many also require specialized conditions. Plants can also introduce or attract unwanted pests. These can include mites, springtails or isopods, which you may not want within your enclosure. Many plants also require a large amount of substrate in order to root in, which can detract from total molting area. Okay, so I'm going to talk about terrariums and vivariums, as I found it was helpful when I was doing my own research. It's worth mentioning that internet groups have slightly altered what these terminologies actually mean. So the actual definitions, terrariums, terra meaning earth, is a type of enclosure that houses just plants. 
on the other hand, vivarium, viva meaning life, is usually referred to keeping animals within an enclosure. Internet groups have slightly altered this, where they usually refer to terrariums as animal enclosures that do not have live plants. On the other hand, a vivarium usually refers to a type of terrarium that has its animals as well as plants and is regarded as being bioactive. It is worth mentioning that there are different types of ariums out there. For example, a paludarium. I don't think that paludariums make suitable enclosures for hermit crabs, as often they contain a large body of standing water in or underneath the substrate line. This means that it might detract available substrate for the crabs to molt in. That means paludariums should be only really applicable to people with large setups that can section off a corner or area of the tank and allow other areas for the crabs to safely molt in. Another popular type of arium is the aquarium. The aquarium is actually a subcategory of a vivarium and it typically only houses aquatic organisms. I feel like it's important to mention that hermit crabs are a land organism, therefore a fully water setup is not indicative to their well-being. So we've looked at aquariums, paludariums, vivariums, the lot, and in the process we've looked at the differences and which ones are actually applicable to our crabs. I feel like it's worth mentioning the term bioactive, as many of these setups are set up in a bioactive way to ensure nutrient cycle. Bioactive basically means that there is multiple organisms that behave in a complex way and completes a cycle in a given enclosure. I think that plants add a layer of bioactive into a setup, and while not required to be a bioactive setup, I do think that they ensure that crab waste is broken down into harmless forms, and therefore is a good addition to have. Okay, so you want plants, now where are you gonna get them? Thankfully, there's many avenues nowadays which you can go down in order to purchase plants. Many, such as like your own garden, neighbors or friends or family, you can get free cuttings that are suitable for your crab tank. There are also online stores, and stemming from this, specialty vivarium stores, which you can purchase online and potentially have it shipped directly to your door. Specialty vivarium stores usually cater towards people like dart froggers or snake keepers, where they grow plants in sterile conditions that are suitable from the get-go. You can also purchase it through a store like Home Depot or in Australia, Bunnings, where the plants also make suitable occupants for your hermit crab tank. For me, I like to look around and shop on price. You might also be limited to what's available to you, or you might be looking for small rare plants that aren't found within your area. It goes without saying that plants also carry hitchhikers which most people term them as pests. These pests are probably not wanted within your hermit crab enclosure, and it's a good idea to have a good look over once you get the plant. It's particularly useful when you go and shop for a plant and you're able to look at each individual specimen to make sure you check it over and look for things such as mite, scale, and other type of unwanted critters. While these critters may be easy to remove, it may require additional quarantine and may require the use of some harsh detergent or some mild detergents that you don't want within your enclosure. Okay, so you've got your plant home and now you want to put it in your tank. I recommend just holding off just for a couple of seconds, particularly if you didn't know the conditions it was grown in prior. 
This is due to many commercial growers, as well as plant hobbyists, using pesticides, fertilizers, or other types of stimulants in order to grow their plants. I always recommend if you don't know what the conditions it was in, better err on the side of caution and just do a quarantine. How I go about quarantining depends on how you got the plant. If it was a potted one, I take it out of the pot, wash the roots the best I can. You don't have to worry about getting everything off, just the vast majority. If at the same time, be gentle, roots are highly delicate. And then after that, you pot it up in crab safe media. If it was a cutting or it was bare rooted, I'd once again recommend just giving it a quick rinse and then pot it up in crab safe media. If it contains no roots, you may wish to propagate it in, for example, sphagnum moss or by using water. And then once it's rooted, pot it up in crab safe media. And by then it should have been good enough to add to the tank because it's been quarantined through propagation. I recommend for smaller plants, so for example, they're less than a foot tall or they have a very thin stem and it's not woody, I recommend waiting about two to four weeks before introducing it to the hermit crab tank. The propagation can also be considered those two to four weeks. And if it's a bigger plant or it has a really thick woody stem, I recommend holding off, waiting slightly longer, do four to eight weeks, even more, before adding it to the tank. I do think that more you wait, the less toxins or potential contaminants you might introduce into your enclosure. I'm just going to give a brief rundown of propagation and how to do so. There is more in-depth and developed information out there on the web that I would recommend checking out so you can get a good idea of what is occurring slash what happens. First is water propagation, which you use water and after a while the plant begins to go roots. Once that occurs, you can either pot it up and then it's free to go. You can also do sphagnum or perlite, which you moisten the sphagnum or you give moist perlite leave it to grow in that once it develops roots take it out pot it up and you're good to go this is by no means an exhaustive list just some examples of how to do so okay so i talked a bit about previously of using wilding hormone as a way to grow plants wilding hormone is used as it allows roots to develop so it becomes a fully functioning plant in a lot of cases the active ingredient is indolbutyric acid or IBM for short and this is used as it leads to the preparation of auxins and cytokines. The toxicity of IBM hasn't really been studied in crabs or at least I couldn't find anything saying it and what I found was a study in rats where it led to the increase and in slash development of myloperidoxidase. Sorry if I butchered it but it's myloperioxidase. This is used um, particularly in white blood cells, so it suggests that there might be a slight toxicity to it. Will it be an issue for crabs if you use rooting hormone? I don't think so, because in a lot of cases you use such a small amount that it gets easily washed away or diluted after a couple of weeks. It takes about a couple of weeks for the roots to develop anyway, and by that time concentrations are so low that you could just take it out of the pot wash the roots well, particularly around the, where the roots connect to the stem, and then you pop it into the tank or into another pot, and you pop it that into the tank, and you should be good to go. Okay, so the plant's quarantined. Now what? If you want to grow them well and successfully within your tank, I like to think to keep most plants happy, you need three things. I say most plants because there's a multitude of different plant species out there and some do require specialized conditions but for the majority of plants substrate water slash nutrients and light are three key ingredients to keep them happy i'm going to break each one of them down and ways that you can add them within your tank to enjoy plants happiness okay so now you want substrate and you want to pot it up or whatever and you're not sure what to do I'd recommend potting it as this will keep delicate roots 
and made disruptions of those roots at a bare minimum. While many do talk about how crabs burrowing and molting and plant roots will affect their molting or potentially kill them, I don't really think that's the case and I feel like it's more that crabs will actually kill the plant through its burrowing or tunneling behaviour. I also like to say that many people put salt in their substrate, while you, some may not agree with it, it is worth keeping in mind that salt doesn't agree with most plants, so keeping them separate is a good idea to go. Adding a pot is also good, because if you want to happen to move it for whatever reason, you have the ability to do so without disrupting malters. For most plants, you want a substrate. Substrate is used in plants as it allows them to take up nutrients from the surrounding soil. This is why I recommend avoiding potting soils and garden soils, as these often contain unwanted pests that you don't want within your enclosure, and many also contain additives such as contaminants and unknown toxins. What do I mean by that is that it's unknown if it's crab safe. Therefore, I recommend EE, coconut fiber, coconut chips, sphagnum moss, sand, gravel, worm castings, charcoal, perlite, water, or a combination, or none of the above. EE or coconut fiber tends to mimic soil very well and is useful in order to retain water. I also find that EE is a great source to use as generally it also releases water vapor as well, so useful to boost humidity. While coconut chunks may seem counterintuitive as you don't want to use it as a molting medium, I do think it also adds aeration towards the medium and it keeps plants happy. Plants need oxygen at the roots and a well-draining soil or oxygenated soil will keep most plants happy. Worm castings is a good nutritious medium that plants love as it contains a lot of waste and it's also crab safe. Crabs will, however, enjoy eating it. Sphagnum moss, while not as good as a standalone, as I find it dries out too readily, can be mixed with other mediums to form a good water retainer similar to EE. I also find that sphagnum moss is great for epiphytic plants, as you can tie it around the roots in order to retain moisture. Sand, gravel, perlite, while not used as a sole medium, once again mixed in, is a great tool in order to have free draining water. Water can also be used. Water I find is a great medium, particularly for aquatic plants. This can be as simple as a freshwater dish or using a small little vase or whatever to contain water. Many plants also do well when rooted in water. Charcoal is another good example, and I find that this is best when mixed into other medias. Charcoal is used primarily as a nutrient absorber, but it can also be used to absorb odors. Epiphyte plants, or epiphytic plants, is plants that don't need soil in order to thrive. These plants grow best when their roots are exposed somewhat and growing on wood, rock, or other types of media. In the wild, these plants typically grow on canopies in trees and do best with just sphagnum moss tied around the roots in order to keep them moist but airy. So what do I recommend? I recommend using a mix as it keeps most plants happy. What I found works best for me is to use a rather chunky or airy mix. So I tend to use around about 50% coconut chunks, 25% EE, and then the remainder of sphagnum, perlite, gravel, you name it, chuck it in there, and it seems to do most plants well. It doesn't have to be expensive, and don't feel like you have to use this mix exactly. You may find, depending on your plant that you choose, or your tank, you may require more or less of one thing. But generally, this is what has worked for me. If you look on the bottom left, you see a mixture of media, that will be roughly about the same that you would do if you were to do it at home. Unfortunately, I ran out of my materials that I use, so I can't actually show you what it looks like, but this is the closest depiction I could see on the web. 
Now some people might be asking about using aquarium soils within their tank. I think yes, it could be used, but let's first talk about a bit what are aquarium soils. So aquarium soils are used in freshwater ecosystems as a way to deliver nutrients to freshwater plants. As a result, they're primarily used in tanks that have plants, in particular in heavy root feeders. Root feeders mean that they primarily use their nutrients or they extract nutrients through their roots. This is certainly crab safe, as many people that keep shrimp, freshwater shrimp, as well as freshwater crabs, including myself, have used such media with no ill effect. Many aqua soils also have additional properties as they are great at absorbing nutrients and then slowly releasing them, almost behaving similar to a slow release fertilizer. I do suggest avoid using it as just your pure media however, as it is very lightweight and plants will likely topple over as their crabs move around. A bag is also pretty pricey, which for me in Australia, a 9 kilo bag is roughly $45. However, I do think it could be mixed within other substrates as a way of adding nutrients into a substrate. The best addition, I think, would be in what it's actually used for. So in an aquarium, so if you've got a large freshwater pool and using the nutrient-rich substrate within that pool, particularly if you're growing freshwater plants. If you're not growing plants, I'd recommend avoiding it as you're just gonna be adding nutrients to the water, which likely will lead to algae blooms. Okay, so you got the plant home, it's potted up, it's ready to go, and you're going to put it in the crab tank, and now you just want to water it. Hold up. Plants need less water than what you think. And I say this from experience, as I've drowned numerous plants full of love, as I try to give them as much water as possible. What I would recommend is it's easier to add water than it is to remove it, so underwatering is probably a better way to go than overwatering. The plant will usually tell you if it's receiving too little or too much water. And it can be a sign such as droopy leaves, if it's underwatered or a whittled stem. And if it's overwatered, it usually begins to droop as well. So it can be easily confused, but also leaves to tend to drop off. Yellow, mold tends to occur more frequently and the plant just never does well. You may find when it comes to watering, it will be a bit of an experiment. This is due to watering being influenced by a number of factors, such as the mix of substrate that you've used for the plant, tank conditions, and also the plant chosen. Therefore, I water roughly every couple of weeks, so one to two weeks, and sometimes up to three weeks depending on the plant. Each plant roughly receives about 30 mils, and if they are epiphytic plant, they usually receive a good spritz using my mister. Of course, you may need to do more or less depending on your taking conditions. I recommend trying out every couple of weeks and seeing how they go. If they start being a bit droopy, then it might be a sign that you need to up the amount of water given or the frequency. And if the substrate's staying too moist, you might need to dial it back and allow it to dry to ensure good oxygenation and doesn't lead to root rot. I recommend using tap water or discarded water from your freshwater pool and also, if you got it, an aquarium. This is because these contain high levels of nutrients which the plants will love and that is why I don't recommend using distilled or spring water as these are typically nutrient devoid and can lead to deficiencies in your plant. I've also been experimenting using chlorinated water to see if there's been any effect on nutrient uptake. I can safely say that it was crab safe, no crabs were harmed, and generally the plants did just as well using chlorinated or dechlorinated water. What I can say from this is that if you happen to forget dechlorination, it won't kill your crabs because it's in such low amounts, and generally the plants do just fine. The addition of nutrients ultimately depends on the type of media used, water source, and the species of plant chosen. The plants will typically need more nutrients the faster they're growing. Nutrients is broken down into macro and micro, 
and macro usually refers to needing higher quantities than micro. Examples of macro include carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Carbon and oxygen is naturally present in the air, while nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium can normally be through animal or crab waste. Micronutrients are usually present in tap water and in trace amounts, so you rarely, if ever, need to use it. If you need to add nutrients for whatever reason, I recommend using either aquarium safe fertilizers or worm castings. If you happen to use aquarium safe fertilizers like what I've been doing, I recommend getting the recommended dose and then diluting that in 20 parts water to one part of that nutrient mix. And then it should be fine and it should be crab safe as it is commonly used in aquatic crabs and shrimp. To put it simply, plants need light. This is in order to photosynthesize. The type of light used will ultimately depend on the plants you want, but generally LEDs, fluorescent light such as T5s, or even natural sunlight will be your best options. If you want additional lighting that sunlight cannot provide, I recommend LEDs or fluorescent lighting. Metal halides could be used in a large enclosure, like for example if they're about like four to six feet tall, and this is simply due to it being an intense wattage and it has a high heat output. When it comes to lights, if you can, look at a PAR rating. This is called the photosynthetic active region. A high PAR is good for plants as it allows their chlorophyll to work properly and efficiently. This also brings out coloration, size or shape in a plant as well. If it doesn't have PAR, don't stress, usually wattage or lumen can correlate to a high PAR rating. Typically, fixtures for aquariums or even just normal fixtures used in regular household equipment will be just fine. Nowadays with technology, there are a lot of new lights on the market. Some have added or extra features that many enjoy using. For example, some lights now contain the ability to ramp up and down gradually so in turn, it kind of simulates how a day-night cycle and as it goes to dusk to dawn. Many lights also in the process of having that ability are Wi-Fi are Bluetooth controlled. So that means you can remotely control it and you don't even have to be in the same room. These controllers also have the ability so you can change the color spectrum of the lighting or the intensity or brightness. And some also have interesting features as they can simulate storms, cloudy days, or even have a night mode. I personally find that night modes on most lights are too light, as the blues are normally too rich in coloration. However, if you've got like a purple light or something, it might be better using and it will be softer on the eyes. But I do think that night lighting is just best if you're just using it to view the crabs, but not every day. Storm settings as well could be run, for example, if you've got a storm in your area, and see if it, how the crabs respond, because in the wild, they'd be exposed to a lot of storm conditions. I would like to hear more about these features, particularly if you've got them, and see how your crabs perform, as there is studies on fish and reptiles, and having these features leads to breeding and whatnot, but not much is understood about crabs, and I'd love to learn about how crabs respond to such features. So lately there's also been a lot of discussion and a lot of people wanting to trial out UVB. Now, the long story short, if you have UVB or you want UVB and you also want plants or you have plants, you may require two separate lighting units or two different fixtures. This is due to UVB not being readily utilized by plants and typically these lights, the UVB lights, only emit a small spectrum and don't emit enough to make plants happy or they don't emit the wavelengths that the plants need in order to photosynthesize. Now I mentioned previously that you don't need an expensive light and I just want to tell you once again you don't need an expensive light. The light that I'm using on my setup is just a cheap one that I got off eBay and it's a three foot LED fixture. It's no name brands, nothing fancy, and it gets the job done. It grows plants just fine. I prefer using LEDs 
as I find that they don't need to be replaced as, like, as regularly as fluorescent light bulbs and they tend to have a longer lasting lifespan, lower heat as well, and generally they're pretty energy efficient. The light that I've got contains different types of LED di diodes, so it's got white, red, green, blue and purple, and overall this color spectrum gives a nice pleasant coloration, which I believe is around about 8000 Kelvin. I typically like my lights running on the slightly cooler side, but it doesn't really matter. You don't need all these colors to have a healthy tank. I just use these colors because that's what the light came with and that's how it's set up. It's meant to state that the red and the blue is typically used for chlorophyll as these parts of the wavelength are typically used for photosynthesis. The green is used to increase coloration in plants so they make them look more green. And the purple I believe is similar to the red and blue, it's just a mix. Of course, I've also got a night setting, but as I mentioned previously, I don't use it. I find it way too bright and it looks gaudy and unnatural as it's a really odd royal blue. But overall, I love my light fixture, it works great and it grows plants just fine. Okay, so now we're actually on the fun stuff because this is what we're all about. We want to put plants in the tank. I've talked about everything that needs in order to grow plants in the tank, but now we're actually talking about putting the plants in the tank. Let's get started. Of course, you might find that I might state some things that you don't agree with. That's totally okay. This is from my own personal um, opinion as well as from my personal observations. And this is what's worked for well for me and other crabbers that I've been in contact with that use planted setups. I generally think that most house plants actually do great in a hermit crab tank setup. And what I recommend is avoiding plants that actually don't do well in high heat or humid environments. For example, many type of succulents don't do well in humid environments unless they are rainforest succulents. And many type of evergreens do best in temperate environments or simply grow too big. Some species of plants that I have had great success in using is bromeliads, particularly from the Tillandsias and the Neogenella species, mosses, pothos, Epipronym aureum, many species of mangroves, which are salt tolerant, philodendron species, tropical succulents, including Ripsalis, aquarium plants, and the prayer plant. Okay, so these are some of the plants that I have grown. It's not an exhaustive list, as I think I might have missed a couple that I can't remember, but these are the ones that I do remember using. So I briefly talked a bit about pothos. I love it. It grows great. The only time it's died is because I forget to water it, and then it doesn't like being dry, so it dies. Bromeliads I also find do pretty well. Some Tillandsias don't really, but I think it was just the species slash variety I chose. It wasn't suitable as some do like dry conditions. Um, a couple of bromelia growers do say that if it has like a dusty or a silvery coating on a Tillandsia, it's best to avoid it as they typically like to be drier. I've tried using some philodendron with mixed success. Most of the times they grow okay and then they kind of just die off. I've also had great success with Ripsalis cactuses and other types of tropical cactuses, and they do great. Another good example are green plants. Um, too many offcuts, such as Anubias, Rotala, Laguigia. I've used all these types well within my tank, as well as floating plants, such as duckweed or floating frogbit. They do pretty well until the crabs decide that they want to eat it. Whatever, they can eat it. I've also tried of using orchids, and they do do okay. But I think that they don't appreciate the constant saturation sometimes. They really like to dry out. And if they dry out, sometimes they can dry out too much. So I've still got to try and find that balance between letting them dry out without letting them dry out completely. <laughs> Of 
I know this might sound controversial, but I think Dracaena or Lucky Bamboo get a bad rap. This is due to many people accidentally or unknowingly have it within their enclosures, and the crabs just do fine with multiple successive molds. I do think that further testing has to be done, and I would actually like to test it on my own colonies before I actually draw conclusions whether they are safe or not. Generally, the toxins that I have found to be the most common are found in houseplants. This is due to it being more likely to be added in your hermocrab tank, as many make suitable candidates. Good examples include saponins, phenols, calcium oxalate, which are also referred to as raphides, cyanogenic glucosides, and other types of glucosides. This is by no means an exhaustive list, just some common examples. Saponins are glycosides and are found in a large number of plants. There has been a diverse amount of them and they are both good and bad for the biological system. They can affect growth, food and reproduction within animals. It is difficult to say whether which type is actually safe and which isn't as it is a very broad group of compound. Many saponins are either removed through biological pathways, for example amylases, or microbial activity. Therefore it's difficult to determine how it is actually removed, but many animals are able to easily remove it from their bodies. Glycosides are another type of complex that many plants use as a defense in. I briefly mentioned one particular type of glycoside, saponins. And there's also numerous other different species that make up this glycoside family or unit. Many drugs or poisons are derived from plants that contain glycosides. And many medicinal drugs is contained or has an active ingredient that has a glycosidic compound. Glycosides tend to be made up of a sugar as well as with other compounds, but generally derived from a sugar. I do also want to mention a particular gene or enzyme called the P450 family. You could also say P450, but I just prefer P450. This is useful as it leads to animal resistance and tolerant to many plant toxins by breaking them down. Due to all animals containing this gene or enzyme, Crabs will also contain the P450 genes. To put in perspective, there are roughly 60 different types of P450 genes that are found in humans. P450 plays an important role in the synthesis of molecules such as hormones, fats such as cholesterols, and multiple acids. A great example of this is calcium oxalates or raphides. This chemical is bitter tasting and is used as a deterrent for most animals. This chemical also has a great affinity to calcium, which is potentially damaging if eaten in large amounts for reptiles and mammals. This is due to calcium being within the bloodstream as it's used for muscle development as well as to ensure proper regulations in biological pathways. And so the removal of calcium leads to insufficient or deficient calcium. The way that the body combats this is by using calcium stored up within the bones and can lead to weak bones. In crabs, however, it is not known where oxalates actually lead to any detrimental effect. And my theory is that while it might, it shouldn't be much of an issue. You need a large quantity for it to ever become an issue as calcium is also used in the diet and will replenish lost calcium taken away by oxalates. For example, spinach is on a safe list of many groups and spinach often contains high levels of oxalates. That is why if you have kidney stones, it's best to avoid spinach due to its oxalates as it greatly increases calcium affinity and kidney stones from developing. However, when crabs are given spinach, they do not die and they do just fine. That is why I don't think that oxalates is much of an issue and generally is crab safe.